This panel follows wonderfully, uh, really on, on the last two uh, interventions, the, in many ways, um, Jim Fallows talking about the ways in which communities across the country are taking care of themselves. They are not waiting for government to solve, for national government to solve their problems. They are looking out for each other and figuring out how to make their communities work. Uh, and then Atul Gawande talking about what care, what love really means in terms of letting others pursue their own goals rather than perhaps your goals for them. Uh, and now we're going to talk about the care economy. And I will say that in keeping with New America's uh, emphasis on big ideas, I think just calling it the care economy is a big idea and is part of how we should be thinking uh, about our economy. Uh, we should be thinking not only about an infrastructure of competition, but an infrastructure of care. So I haven't introduced myself or anybody who might not know. I'm Anne-Marie Slaughter. I'm the head uh, of New America. The, uh, and I'm going to introduce my panel, and we're going to have a, a conversation. So immediately to my left is Mohamed el Irian. Uh, who is a New America board member, and that is his primary distinction. Uh, <laughs> in addition, he is the uh, chief economic advisor at Allianz, which is the corporate parent for PIMCO, uh, and Mohammed was the uh, chief executive uh, and co-chief executive investment officer uh, for a long time. He chairs President Obama's Global Development Fund, and as a columnist, you've read him in many different places. Uh, I just want to say uh, he's going to explain why, given that bio, he's on a panel about the care economy, because it might not be a, immediately apparent. I'll say that when I went to go and talk at PIMCO, uh, I gave a talk on foreign policy, and then I talked to a group called PIMCO Parents. And it was very important that it was called PIMCO Parents. It was not called the women's group. It was not called mothers. It was called PIMCO Parents and a third of the people there, and this is a very high pressure industry, uh, were men. So uh, to his left is Sarita Gupta, who's the co-director of Caring Across Generations. Uh, that's a national coalition of some 200 advocacy organizations working together uh, for quality care and support and following a tool, uh, a dignified quality of life for all Americans. Uh, she's also the executive director of Jobs with Justice, uh, which uh, she, being, she's really an expert on the economic uh, and social issues affecting uh, working Americans across all industries. Uh, to her left is Latifa Lyles, uh, who is a great friend in New America. She's been in on a number of our panels this year. She's the director of the Women's Bureau uh, at the U.S. Department of Labor. Uh, so she is working uh, to improve standards uh, and, and uh, opportunities for all women in the workforce. Uh, last year, she oversaw an absolutely spectacular summit that the White House put on, a summit on working families that was a summit about the care economy in many ways, even if it wasn't, wasn't framed exactly that way. Uh, and our last, uh, not last down the row, uh, is uh, Sheila Lirio Marcelo, who is an entrepreneur uh, and a leader who has created care.com. Now, in this presence, uh, in this community in particular, we emphasize the .com. Helene Gale is also a board member who's just uh, stepped down as head of care. Uh, this is care.com, uh, and it is a rapidly growing uh, company uh, that is the largest online care destination in the world. It has 13.3 million members uh, in 16 countries. Uh, and Sheila will talk again about uh, how she got into this business. So with that, I'm going to start by asking you, and actually I think I'll ask Sheila first, and we'll go down this way, to talk about um, why are you in this business? I just set you up there inadvertently, <laughs> but what led you to be focusing on care? I think it's, it is appropriate that uh, just hearing a tool's uh, book on being mortal, um, I think that, you know, I got pregnant in college, and it is very personal, and I was an immigrant born and raised in the Philippines, and I came to the United States and uh, had to struggle to, to find care for our little guy and, and married a man whose parents were deceased. And so fast forward, when we had our second child, we struggled through grad school and our careers, and then when we had our second child, I begged my parents to come from the Philippines to take care of him because we were working at a startup and his little boy's named Adam. He's now 15 years old. But as, as my father was walking up the stairs with him, he fell backwards and had a heart attack. 
And so at 29 years old, I found myself part of this sandwich generation. And yet I was working in a technology company and found that I was using the yellow pages to look for care. And it didn't make any sense. And I needed care to work. And it was critical. And found that millions, billions of families depend on care to just have a livelihood. And there is this codependency between care and, and jobs. You need a great job to pay, pay for great care. And you want great care so you have peace of mind so you can focus on work. And so that's, that's really been the inspiration is my own personal passion and realizing that this was a true pain point in my own life and using my background in business and in technology to build something to help people. Thank you. Latifa. Thank you. So again, um, thank you so much for, for having us here. Growing up, I, um, in the New York City is where I'm from, um, I didn't have a very large family. It was just my brother um, and me. But my grandmother raised six, seven children. Um, some of my uncles were very close to me in age. We were often by ourselves. Um, you know, with, I was at three, you know, with a six and eight year old, um, oh, or my, my earliest memories. <laughs> I don't remember any adults at all. But the, but the, this, but the very important um, thing uh, for what I do now and being at the Department of Labor working for standards that improve the lives of workers is that my grandmother was, um, in addition to raising seven children, she was a direct care home worker herself. Um, and the, the, what we're doing at the Department of Labor to ensure basic standards and including basic uh, standards and protections for good wages um, is so important to me personally, understanding that it's um, the likelihood that my grandmother was making not just under minimum wage as a home care worker raising six kids, seven kids by herself and me, um, but uh, she was probably making a whole lot less than minimum wage uh, for several years. And the thing that's so moving to me is that I always thought of her job as really cool. Um, she would come home and talk about her, her clients, she called them, and the people that she would visit. They called, they, she would, they called themselves uh, nursing home attendants at the time. And I used to tell people very proudly what my grandmother did because I thought it was such a cool and important job. And of course, it wasn't until I was older that I realized uh, just how this, 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 this group of workers have, have been for so many decades treated as second class workers. So uh, that's my little, that's my personal uh, pull in this, but certainly um, it permeates all the work we do, which is dignity and value of, of people who are in this community. You know, there's a direct connection between what you just said and what Atul was saying to us about not being able to project forward how, what, who we will be and what we will want. Because if we project forward that, yes, of course, we are going to be uh, ill, we are going to need healthcare uh, home attendance to allow us to live in our homes and to have the dignity that we want, we would think that's a really important job. Mm -hmm. We would think that's a job that matters to every single one of us, but we can't project forward. Mm -hmm. So Sarita, that definitely <laughs> brings us to, to you yeah. in terms of your work. Well, for me, the personal connection um, to this issue is um, a, f a few years ago, my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and um, it was a really startling moment for my family to figure out how do we best support him and my mother, who's been his sort of primary caregiver um, for a while, um, through this journey, and how do we ensure that my father can you know, age with dignity, live with independence, uh, be able to stay in our home, uh, in the community that they built. My parents immigrated, you know, we immigrated, our family immigrated um, over 40 years ago. Um, so building community was a big part of what they did. And so the notion of, you know, how do we support him and my mother to remain in community was a big struggle, frankly, that I had and, and my family had. And actually, a lot of what Sheila said, I'm part of the sandwich generation myself. I actually like to call us the Panini generation. <laughs> <laughs> because we're so pressed, actually. I have a five-year-old daughter. That's tweetable. <laughs> Somebody tweeted. <laughs> I have a five-year-old daughter, and um, actually this past Christmas uh, helped my parents move from their home of 40 years in Rochester, New York, and move them into my home. Um, and we're building, literally, a multi-generational 
house to figure out the best ways to support um, my parents through this journey and frankly to support all of us. Uh, there's so many of us, sandwich generation, panini generation people out there who are struggling alone. Like we're really struggling with these questions alone. And part of what I'm learning through this work is the importance of bringing this out into the public sphere and finding solutions yeah. together. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Yeah. I'm going to call it the Panini generation now, and it's wonderful. <laughs> Muhammad. So I'm going to be consistent with what someone told me when I was 16, which was that I'm boring and un unimaginative. Um, she was my first girlfriend, by the way. Um, so I got here through a, a cumulative personal, professional, and research journey that did not stop at the obvious statement that, to use Atul's um, phrasing, that well-being is about more than economic prosperity. Mm. It went to the next stage with saying that economic prosperity is actually a function of taking seriously the caring economy, which, which exploded in my mind a lot of trade-offs that I as an economist grew up with. You're told there's a trade-off between efficiency and equity, but there isn't. Okay? You're, tr you're taught at, as a CEO that you can't be caring in a meritocracy. Well, that's not true. And that cumulative journey started because while I was born in New York, I spent the first 10 years in Egypt, and I was surrounded by a lot of deprivation. And I realized that the only reason that I was different is because my father cared enough to invest every penny in my education. Why? Because education had been for him the great enabler and the great empowerment. Then fast forward to university when I was lucky enough to, to be taught that learning economics is about look, learning through four different schools of thought, which suddenly you realize there's different ways about thinking about this and you become more inter interdisciplinary. And then as a CEO, I learned the hard way. <laughs> I learned through a series of slippages that we were making because we weren't asking the right question. From the most amazing person who was leaving the firm, and I decided, let me meet with them to ask why. And when I met, I said, I'm not trying to make you change your mind. I just want to understand why. And the answer was, because you can either be 100% or zero at PIMCO. And I said, that's not true. Someone as capable of you functioning 65% is worth 100% of many other people that we're going to hire. So let's talk about how is it that we make this happen. Or this wonderful woman that we were interviewing, and we were absolutely convinced she was coming to PIMCO. And she let us down. So I called, and I said, Again, I don't want to convince you to come. I just want to understand why, because we were under the impression. She said, you know, you kept me there for two days of interviews, and I was really excited till I realized that there wasn't a single woman who interviewed me, only <laughs> men interviewed. So I called our HR department. I said, how do we set up interview lists? And they said, well, we first interview for skills, expertise, then we look at fit. And it was very scientific. And I said, do we ever ask the question, what signals are we giving? Do we ever care about what the other person is receiving in terms of signals? So for me, it's been a sort of a cumulative journey to realizing that if you want to succeed in a society economically, in a meritocracy, in a company, in a household, you've got to take a much more holistic approach. Otherwise, you will fall short. And in your own life, so in my own life, I'm lucky enough to, 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 to have been able to make choices that came late in life. And the choice I made, um, which, which made much more noise than it should, but that tells you something, is that the time had come for me to spend more time with my daughter. Mm. Right? And I'm lucky enough to be able to do it. It's a privilege to be able to do it. So, so, so every day, you know, I count my lucky stars that I'm able to do that. But what has struck me is the reaction to that. <laughs> right. Don't I know it? <laughs> so we've been talking about sort of the value of care and what, what uh, and how we, how each of you has has navigated that in your own lives. Well, I want to talk about now how do we, how do we get people to be thinking about the care economy? 
How, how do we, this is a framing, we can frame it any way we want. Uh, you know, I, I've been thinking about this now for three years working on a book uh, and, and thinking about how do we get people to acknowledge that care is as important a part of our lives as competition. Indeed, if you don't have a foundation of care, it's very hard for you to compete effectively, either because no one's invested in you or no one's taking care of your loved ones. But, and Sheila, I'm gonna ask you to lead off here again. You're, you're essentially creating a business that is, assumes there is a huge market for care. Right. And that there's a market that is not just a, the, the, you know, the way the current market for care, which is very low paid and very low valued. So it's low paid in terms of money and in terms of prestige. Uh, how, how do we sh make that shift? And, and, and where do you see your own industry evolving? Sure. It's a very fragmented industry. And in fact, when I first started it, a lot of people were questioning whether we could even scale it. Uh, because of low income wages, where can you find the profit around these things? What I've been actually doing is doing a lot of advocacy as a social entrepreneur. So a few things that I put out there, I just did um, a speech at a private equity women's summit, uh, as, a, as an example, and I, I tend to be very picky about those things because I'm trying to choose, of course, wisely being a CEO and at the same time advocating. So a few things I emphasize. This is a $243 billion industry. Childcare and senior care, a majority of that. And uh, it is as big as the legal industry. And we are a litigious society. As big as uh, medical devices, as big as gambling. A lot of investment goes into those industries. I also emphasize that now, based on research, and we've worked with different nonprofits, is that we found that the number one budgetary item for families is actually care. And that's only measuring childcare. I haven't even factored in the sandwich generation or the panini generation <laughs> uh, that is uh, caught up in all of that with senior care. And that's $18,000. That's higher than mortgage and rent, and even higher than college education. And, and what impacts companies? It's actually overall productivity. But what drives that? It's absenteeism. And what drives absenteeism? It's when care doesn't work at home. So these facts and getting it out there, advocating at all channels, especially in the business community, which we're doing in partnership with New America, is to raise that awareness so that CEOs are very aware and not waiting for enlightenment to happen is for them to actually see that the data is there and to realize that this is an economic imperative. When you close your eyes, what do you think when you think of care? You think of your kids, you think of the, your loved ones. It's the soft side of care. But this is an economic imperative. It drives, as Mohammed pointed out, economic growth. Why? Female participation in the workplace drives jobs, keeps them in jobs. But you can't actually do that unless you have a care infrastructure. And I love what Anne-Marie says. It's like we invest in road, roads and bridges, but we don't invest in care. Care drives the economy. And so it's, it's raising that awareness, stating in statistics, stating in real data, and making an influence and making an impact so that people understand every day that if you're in the business or in the government, in any institution, that you can influence how you think about care. You know, the cost of childcare for two kids exceeds the cost of rent in all 50 states. Which is an astounding amount, but you know, and, and you'll pay for it, right? Yes. You have to pay for it. If you can't pay for it, you, can, you can't yes. work. Latifa. Sure. So on the, on the economic side, I think it's really important for, for people to realize that um, this is the norm for, for most families. 40 million families care for an elderly relative. 30 million have young children. I think that while there's this, this idea that care happens at certain parts of your life, and then it's over, is really you know, not the reality, number one. Number two, looking especially at the, wage, the wages issue, we know that a quarter of a million dollars is lost for an individual because of unpaid care, including wages and social security. Over a lifetime, yeah. a quarter of a million. Over, over a lifetime. And this is not just for women, this is for all, for all people. Nine million adults over 50 care for an older relative. And I think what we are really grappling with, and I'm glad you brought up the participation in the labor force, is that individuals suffer from an economic perspective. We're not contributing to the economy. 
But if, for example, prime age women were participating in the labor force at the same rate as women in Canada and Germany, let's say, that would be $500 billion in our economy that we don't currently have. 3.5% of GDP, as some of the estimates show, in terms of um, what, we hoped, what we could gain in this country. I've, I believe very, very strongly that, um, you know, as, and this is something that a lot of uh, the folks in the advocacy space in this area talk about, is that we're talking really in some ways too, from a labor perspective, about a new standard. What does it mean to have supports and policies in place that workers can benefit from because of the reality of today and the reality of their lives. One of the very, very key components of the work we're doing with Secretary Perez and the White House is what we can do across the country to motivate and stimulate states to take advantage of this momentum where they can study, implement, test models, because we know so many states are doing this already, and we're trying to do our best to support this, because we know it's not gonna happen at the federal level anytime soon, what do we need to do at least at the local level to make sure that workers are protected? And we're not just talking about job protected leave um, that's unpaid, we're talking about paid sick days, we're talking about paid family and medical leave. And uh, we were at an event with the secretary or the president last week, uh, raising up champions who across the country have been working on both paid family leave, sick days, and all of these issues around the country and he said, um, which is, you know, we all know this in this room, but when you hear it, it's so remarkable that um, p women don't even have, most women don't even have a guaranteed, by law, a guaranteed, one guaranteed paid day for them to have their child. So we talk a lot about this idea that you want to stay home and take care of your child and, you know, you, know, you just, need, but really, that time that you're even in the hospital to give birth is not covered. Um, you know, this is, this is, this is really, um, for us, a time for us as a nation to really get together to figure out how we can really catch up with the global economy on this so that countries all over the world who are putting the economics of their workers first and bringing together the business community and the worker community have already got this right. And the United States um, is really just catching up and we're doing what we can to help move the ball forward. It's just astounding. I mean, people have heard this, that we and Papua New Guinea uh, and I think Swaziland and Lesotho are the only countries in the world that don't have paid maternity leave. There are lots of countries that, that don't have paid paternity leave, but every other country in the world assumes that a woman yes. at least needs some time to, to, to have a child. You know, as you were talking, Sheila and I were, were exchanging glances because when you talk about new standards, New America is partnering with Care.com uh, to create a care index where we're going to rate states according to their care infrastructure, the state of their care infrastructure. And because there are countless indexes on gender, right? That's great, but the, there, there's nothing that, that actually measures care, which of course has a huge impact sure. on women's ability to advance. But as you said, it's not just women, it, it's men. So we, we definitely want to, want to, want to talk. Uh, so Sarita, you, you know, you work, Caring Across Generations, is, you work with Ai-jen Poo, yeah. and her book, The Age of Dignity, which is another great read, uh, that of being mortal uh, mm -hmm. at the, now, she writes about the elder boom, yeah. right? which of course is right. I, I was born in 1958. That's the height of the baby boom because the people who had been having kids in 1945 were still having kids yeah. and people like my parents uh, were, were starting to have kids. So, you know, we are, 10,000 of us are retiring every day. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are, the, we've got this enormous elder boom. So how do you look at the care economy? Well, speaking of the elder boom, I, I always have to throw this, this little statistic out that every eight seconds, someone in America is turning 65. So this year alone, four million people will turn 65, reach retirement age. And thank, thankfully, you know, we're, people are living much longer lives, um, which is great. But the demographics are really important to keep in mind as we talk about a care economy. By the year 2030, 20% of our population will be over the age of 65, right? So already there is a huge demand for long-term supports and services, whether it's in the form of home care or um, institutional care. Um, but what we also know is that 
Uh, people want to be able to age in their homes, in their place, right? AARP just did a study, 90% of aging adults prefer to live in their homes, age in their homes. Um, so we can't actually afford to not have a plan to meet the new realities of an aging population in this country. So we've talked a little bit about the Panini generation and what families and how families are struggling through this. We're also really clear that the future of care needs to embrace and develop and support a much stronger home care workforce. Because for families like myself, we need that support in order to continue to work full time, right? And to ensure that people like my father can in fact age with dignity, with independence, and live at home. So it is really critical, and I have to really uh, appreciate so much of the work that Latifa and the Department of Labor and the White House is doing on raising standards, because the reality is these home care jobs are they pay unfathomably low wages. I mean, on average, about a little over $9 an hour. You know, these are, and we only have 2 million home care workers in our economy today, yet we know the needs are going to grow. I mean, by 2040, nearly 30 million Americans will need some form of direct care to meet their daily basic needs. So this is this is a, uh, could be a crisis, and, but we like to think at Caring Across Generations, this is a huge opportunity for us to get in front of this and really begin to think about how to strengthen the workforce, how we create good jobs, make sure they're good quality jobs that families can rely on, and make sure that we're creating as many caregiving options to families that we can. And we like to think about it as sort of the care grid, like the infrastructure, I love, I right? Love that one, yeah. So we talk about it as the care grid. Just like we've built infrastructures as a nation in the past, bringing water and electricity into every American home, and hopefully someday we'll be able to do that with the internet. Um, our, our vision is we need a care grid in our, in our uh, economy. We need to be able to bring as many caregiving options as possible into every home in America. Um, that's what's, what it's going to take to really embrace and build out this care economy. And I, I'm really confident we can get there by building a caring majority of us that are helping to provide creative solutions, innovations, and thoughts on how we ensure that every person uh, gets the kind of care that they need, and we build a strong workforce to support that the families in need, but also themselves. Because one of the worst stories of our care economy today is how many care workers who care for our loved ones can't support themselves or their own families. And that doesn't have to be the way it is. So we're excited about building out a care grid. So the, a couple of responses uh, on that. And the, the care grid is exactly what we're talking about when we talk about a care index. As part of what you have to define is what goes into that. So you know, provisions for child care and elder care are obvious. But yeah. there's, there's more than that, right? There's early education. There's therapy of various kinds, right? There's mental health care. There, if we think about all the ways in which we need to actually support loved ones yeah. and defining that and figuring and then measuring it, I, it, yeah. it is an important piece. Um, two other things you said I thought were interesting. There is a big real estate angle here. Jim Fallows was talking about real estate and important importance of real estate, one of the answers has to be more multi-generational living. Exactly. You know, we are single family livers. Uh, yeah. And I, I'm very close to my own family, and I'm always struck that the only time we have multi-generational living is holidays, yeah. which is not exactly the norm, right? There's a lot of pressure around that. That's sort of what, what my parents assume growing up, which was that you had different family members around, is not something that we do. Uh, and the last thing, just to, to tie what you said about what it takes to be a good home health care worker, again goes back to what Atul Gawande was talking about. There's a wonderful place in his book where he quotes the woman uh, who was founded the assisted living movement. Mm -hmm. And he says, he points out that you know, taking care of older people is a lot like taking care of toddlers in the sense that you have to let them do what they still can do, right? They want autonomy. It is easier for you to do it. I mean, just as the mother of a young child, it's much easier yes. for you to just get it done. 
that person, when it's a young child, they're not learning. But when it's an older person, you're depriving them of the very dignity and autonomy that's they right. need. And that's, that's a skilled job. That it takes is. really understanding and understanding what you do for them and what you don't do for them and what risks you allow them to take. Right. So it, 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 for us to, to make it a good caring relationship, it is, it's not a matter of just lifting people in and out of bed. That's right. So, Mohammed, I wanted to ask you to maybe look at this from more the insurance perspective, the Allianz perspective. In other words, is this, I mean, part of this, I wanted you to reflect on how other countries think about this, but also how you see it more from a, from a business perspective. I mean, from a business perspective, the most obvious thing, and it's from an economic perspective, and, and, and we've heard it on this panel, is that the business case and the economic case for the care economy is very strong and yet it's not translated into actions. So, so there's a failure there, there's a market failure, if you like. And the market failure is that the notional supply and the notional demand of something that makes households, companies, and economies better off is not translated into effective demand and effective supply. Right? Th that's the market failure. Part of it is because we don't ask the right questions. I was very struck by, it. when I worked, you bring someone in and you say, okay, I want to make you more productive. What does it take? Does it take a better trading system? Does it take a better computer? Mm. Right? We frame the questions. And, and our aha moment as a collective came when we decided after the financial crisis that the world was going to look different. We phrased it at that point as the new normal. And therefore, our people had to think differently. So we brought in a, 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 a professor, uh, first from the London Business School, who said your biggest trap is what's called active inertia, that you feel that you have to do something different, but you continue doing the same thing. <laughs> and there's many, many companies that do that. It drives so, my life. <laughs> so how do, you, how do you overcome active inertia? By exposing people to the fact that we all have blind spot and unconscious biases. Mm. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's how we are wired. So we brought this wonderful professor from Harvard, Professor Banaji. Oh, she's great, yeah. And we, we brought the whole firm in a big ballroom. And 90% of the people there didn't want to be there. Right. And she was great because she took us through example after example that proved to the people sitting in the room beyond any doubt that they were subject to unconscious bias and blind mm -hmm. spots. And then, she explained the science of it and what we can do about it. My own experience is I was sitting with the financial engineers who had self-selected right at the back of the room on the side, <laughs> and their view was this soft stuff, yeah, that's true for the, for the marketers. The marketers need this. But we are financial engineers. We don't need this. And you could see the skepticism and, and the body language. And then there was one thing, one episode where, where Professor Banaji brought a, one of these old overhead, overhead projectors. She had to explain to the room what an overhead projector was <laughs> because half the room hadn't seen one. And then she put a slide which had two different figures and said, how many of you believe that these figures are the same? Nobody put their hands up. How many of you believe they're different? Everybody put their hand up. Then she took a second slide. It fit exactly on the first one, took it over, and it fit exactly on the second one. And that was an aha. And then she said, if anybody wants to try this and you don't believe what you just saw, come on up. Of course, my table came running up um, to try it. And then she explained the science. Why is it that as we develop, as our brains develop, we start having these blind spots? And one of the blind spots is these wrong trade-offs that, that we think a care economy is inconsistent with a market-based economy. Actually, it's not. It supports a market-based economy. Exactly. And I think, to end on a positive note, the, the most amazing thing today is that there are two major advances that make this a lot easier. Technology and behavioral science. And any company who wants to succeed has got to hardwire insight from both these things. And if you do that, it becomes much easier because you allow structure due to the heavy lifting. The analytics become much easier. And once the analytics become much easier, the buy-in becomes much easier. And once the buy-in becomes much easier, you ask the right questions and then hopefully you get out of this active inertia. So I want to ask you a question. If, if you had asked me 
what would have made the difference uh, for, let's say I'm working for PIMCO and I've got two kids and I'm, I, I, I just can't do it. And PIMCO people travel a lot. If you'd asked me, I'd have said, well, if you really want to make a difference, you will pay for my childcare person sure. to travel with me and my <laughs> child uh, while, uh, to, to go to whatever conference. If I'd said that, which I've been in plenty of conversations where women say, yeah, this is what would really make a difference, but there's no way they're gonna pay for that. What would you have said? So first of all, it's stunning to us that when, when, when you ask that question, no one says it. When you do a blind survey, childcare comes as the number one issue. Yeah. Right? And yeah. the reason why people don't want to say it is they're afraid. Exactly. They're exactly. Gonna. So I, I had another experience, which is that I met with uh, pregnant women. And what, what made me do this was something from Sheryl Sandberg's Lean that someone sent me an early copy of and said, read this. And I read it. And there was a story about, about her being pregnant. Yeah. Right? So I, I brought women who are pregnant and women who had just had babies, and I said, what can we do okay, to make your life better and make your life more productive? What I got was 10% of, of, of what they really wanted to tell me. Yeah, right? that's what 10% I mean. of what they really wanted to tell me, right? <laughs> and and it, I had to convince them that, there is, that this is a comfort, that this is a safe zone to have this discussion. So, so I tell you, one of the great things we did is actually, actually introduce childcare. We didn't have childcare before. And that was transformational mm. because people stopped worrying. Mm -hmm. and, and absenteeism came down and, and things like that. So just asking the question but creating the safe zone and, and making people understand that this is actually a merit-based approach. Right. It, it's consistent with, uh, with you being a better business, a better household, and a, be and a better economy and society. Okay. So we've got only 10 minutes. So I'm going to ask you the, the sort of, if you could wave a wand question. What do we need to help people make that safe zone? And uh, Mohammed, I'm going to ask you particularly, well, all of you to reflect on the role of men in helping make it a safe zone. Because as you said, the reason somebody like me is not going to ask that question is I'm absolutely afraid that if I say what I really need, you're going to say she's not committed to her career or that's too expensive or whatever. So what do we do? Uh, and how do we do more broadly, sort of what do we do through regulation? What do we do through business? But I want to, I want to also pose, uh, Sheila said she was talking to a women's equity f firm. Why aren't the, you know, the proliferation of private equity <laughs> Uh, firms and, and other investment firms not flocking to invest in this economy, and how do we change that? Because it's absolutely crazy, given the business case, that this isn't seen as a huge investment opportunity, but it's not. So I'm going to now go back down and let Sheila in, so I'll start with you again. Okay, so I think first just awareness is a big issue. It's a big issue, and it's not easy because you're overcoming decades of conventional wisdom that actually is not very wise, right? So to address awareness um, is a key element. Men is very, are very important because if you take your initial conditions, okay, men still control a lot of the decision making. We noticed. Right. Um, I mean, you, you don't know how unusual it is for me to sit, okay, and be the only man. Normally, now, now I feel for, for when I sit on panels, there's only one woman, right? Um, so, 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 so the awareness of men is really important, and, and, and that comes through, again, we, we keep on reinforcing this is about the business case, this is about the economic case. And as I say, it's much easier these days because the evidence is really compelling. And then there's a ton of stuff we can do at the macro level. Gender pay, okay, it, that, it's just ridiculous. You know, we have laws and yet people behave in a way that, that actually is inconsistent with the law. There's lots of stuff we can do in terms of how we think about, quote, inclusive capitalism. How we think about yesterday's panel, inclusive finance, right? It's actually, making people more productive. It's enabling and empowering people. So there's lots of stuff to be done at the policy side that again explode this myth that there is a trade-off. There is actually, the trade-off is not there. And if people who have, have researched that. Um, taking inequality seriously. And it's not just an inequality of income and wealth, it is the fact that today's inequality has become so extreme that it speaks to an inequality of opportunity. And the minute you start talking about inequality of opportunity, you start talking about lost generations. The minute you start talking about lost generations, you start talking about a tremendous loss in potential 
um, output. So there's, there's actually a whole menu of things that are not as politically controversial hmm. as you may think to begin with. Very helpful. Sarita. Well, I'd like to offer, when, we, when I think about the care economy and what it's going to take, I actually think we have to um, spark conversations across generations. So, like, it's true men and women need to talk, but we also actually have to understand that this issue is um, one that is really important for all generations um, of our nation right now. And so much of the work that I've, you know, through Caring Across Generations we've been trying to do is to really spark um, meaningful conversations about the issue of care. And, but part of that is we have to have a culture shift in our country. I mean, frankly, most people are profoundly afraid of aging and talking about death, right? Um, as Atul talked about earlier and others, um, we also know that because these issues are so personal, again, people hold it personally and don't talk about it, feel comfortable telling their care story. And we know, I'm sure if we went around this room, everybody would have some sort of a care story to tell. And so part of what we feel like we have to do in terms of the culture shifts is help value caregiving, caregivers, that the value care in our economy, in our society as a whole, um, that two, we actually need to embrace the power of multi-generational relationships as part of the solutions for how we deal with the issues of care. Um, and then thirdly, that we really need to lift up both the joys and the complexities of aging. Because I think sometimes we can go right into the doom and gloom. Like some people talk about the elder boom as the silver tsunami, <laughs> the crisis <laughs> impending. But there's such beautiful it joy is. in yeah. aging. And how we lift those up together and spark a really different kind of conversation that can really spark our imaginations to be as innovative and creative around the solutions that we need. And we think by doing that, I think that by doing that, we can in fact create a different climate for the kinds of practices that need to happen in the workplace, to begin to think about the policy interventions that we can make, right? Like what would it mean for us to get in front of this issue of care jobs and actually name how many we need and what those kinds of jobs can be and the trainings and supports that are needed, to also be more thoughtful about what, what, what is the care grid infrastructure we can and should be building? But it's really hard in the political climate we are in today to even begin that conversation unless we really spark a very different kind of conversation where we're really reaching, sorry, I was reaching the hearts and minds of people. This is an issue that matters to every single one of us. Absolutely. And so as soon as we can spark, you know, really reach the hearts and minds of people, I really believe as a nation we can stand up and make sure that every person has the opportunity to live to their highest potential through every stage of life. Um, and that's really what uh, I think it's gonna take. Thank you. Uh, I, one thing I will point out there in terms of care stories and making care central, I don't think it's accidental that not a single one of you is from the dominant culture in the United <laughs> States. And I really mean that, yeah. right? That yeah. we are going to become plurality Hispanic. We are, are you know, you're all from different uh, uh, cultures that actually value family and multi generational care far more than a traditional white wasp culture. Mm. So just, mm. just a point. Latifa. So, building a little bit on the culture piece, or there are two things. One is that the most compelling game changer, conversation changers that I've been a part of is where the business community or CEOs um, acknowledge the, the economic uh, you know, non-issues that there are, <laughs> but, then, but then actually say, we're doing this because it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I've been in several rooms and there's one or two CEOs who will you know, decide not to lead with the economic case, but rather say, you know, this is, this is our moral fiber um, as contributors to the economy and this is why it's important to my company. And I think that that does put a completely different light on these advocacy discussions. Secondly, um, I believe very strongly that you know, thinking of these as, you know, not, they're individual 
issues, obviously, but really they're, they're structural. These are really truly at the core structural issues. And I think that that's what we're trying to, 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 to move toward to understand that part of the reasons people don't talk about what they really need is because this is a problem I have to fix individually. This is not an expectation that I have of my employer. This is not an expectation I have um, of, of, of the economy. So that's another conversation changer. And then the last thing on the conversation and culture piece is I think for elder care versus child care in some ways, um, you know, I have so many stories of people who are dealing with uh, care for their parents or aging relatives, and the structure and support networks, uh, the time that they don't have because they have children or they can't afford it, really does go into this sort of vacuum of advocacy because there's so many emotional um, things that are tied into what you're doing and your parents are not children, really, so they are very, very, very strong-minded themselves. And I, and I know that seeing my mom go through this, that there is a, there's at certain points sort of like a throw in the towel, both from a perspective of you're advocating with your parents, you're advocating with the care community, and I think that people who are taking care of elder relatives don't have the kinds of networks perhaps that some of us do for our children, and I think that, that creating that network of support is really going to be critical for advocacy because we want the thing to happen. Sometimes we don't have a lot of choices or time. There's financial uh, implications. Uh, there's health. I mean, there's, it's really not as simple as I'm going to go home and sort of do some internet research and look right. at some listservs about the best place. I mean, it's really very complex, and these are really critical decisions that I think are often made in really dire times when people don't have a lot of support. Um, and then on the other piece of it, obviously, you know, we talked about this too, but you know, it's really time that we think about our workers um, as people and people with families. Um, there are very few people that don't have to care for families, that don't have children. Um, women, 75% of, of women are going to have a child while they're working. There's some realities of today uh, that I think we need to keep talking about. The reality of women working into the third, third trimester of their, of, their, of their pregnancies and some things that have changed over the past several decades, some that have not. But I think that there are some stark realities that if we take them off of the individual and think more about uh, who's in our who's in the cubes where we are, where, where we are on the shop room floor, um, then perhaps we can close this gap of where the answers are there, but we're still trailing behind. And obviously, um, how we compensate workers for their time is really critical. Thank you. Sheila, you get the last yeah. word. <laughs> so I think it is a combination of public-private uh, partnerships, uh, investing in infrastructure, thinking about generations, um, and engaging everybody in the conversation. Anne-Marie, you, you asked sort of this poignant question, how do we convince white males, men, and many that I talk to in the investment community, that this is an industry worth investing in because it's necessary not only for moral reasons, societal reasons, because we've got a crisis coming, even though we can see the joy of aging, it, it's real, is that there's an economic reason. So here's four things, and it's an acronym, it's simple, it's actually care. I say to them, see, you've got to invest and train caregivers. Sarita pointed out there will be a shortage of supply. And if you don't invest in them, we're going to run into a problem. Why? Women are actually opting out of marriage, and they're opting out of having children. Yeah. So soon you're going to have single men, and who's going to take care of their, their parents? What's the C? The C, train caregivers. C for caregiving. Okay. <laughs> train, sorry, train caregivers. We must train caregivers. There's a shortage of supply. A is accountability. In this country, and we haven't even gotten into elder care, nail salons are audited more than daycares. Jeez. And we haven't even gotten to the regulation of what needs to happen in home care agencies and elder care and daycare and child care is further along than even senior care. Our respect, and I, I really support NDWA, IGEN, caring for across generations, we have to respect the caregivers. If we're gonna track caregivers and professionalize them, we have to pay them above minimum wage, we have to give them vacations, we have to give them time off, because how are we gonna attract people to care and allow our, our parents to age with dignity and, and, and make sure that our kids, because their brain's developing as, as babies, mm -hmm. we need them just as much as we think about educators. We have to respect caregivers. And, and, and think about nannies as driving the economy and babysitters driving the economy because they allow us to do what we do in this room.
care for our loved ones. An E for excellence, which Anne-Marie and I really focus on around how do we create transparency and measurement of care by cost, quality, and availability, create an index, make it a public good available to all to put pressure on so that we can really understand the quality and standards that's necessary to drive the economy, and that's the care economy. Thank you. That's great. So let me just say one last word, which is uh, in the book that I've been working on for the last three years that will now come out September 29th. I can't say that often enough. <laughs> 29th, uh, my essential argument in, in two sentences is that the great stall in the women's movement, meaning that we have not really advanced in terms of numbers of women at the top for 20 years, We've been focusing on that issue as a problem of discrimination or a problem of lack of assertiveness or a problem of something to do with women. I think the problem is the devaluing of care, that we liberated women to be their fathers, and along the way we completely devalued the work our mothers did, which was sort of essential because that's where the power was, but what happened was that we devalued care in terms of individual women who take time out to take care of their families who are devalued, in terms of the workers who are caregivers, uh, in terms of the entire understanding of the vital foundation that care provides for competition. And we'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.